Hi everyone, welcome to Historical Games Network. This is uh, quite scarily our ninth panel, um, and it's on player practices. Um, and we've got three amazing guests to talk to today um, about this subject. And so, we're, as we talk about player practices, we're thinking about um, this in the in a really broad sense, in any way that really sort of brings together players and games and history. Um, but we're really interested in the things that players do um, around games. Um, my my name is Nick Weber. I'm going to be chairing the proceedings, um, and I shall introduce our three guests to you now. So first of all, we've got Marie Fulston. Uh, Marie is a leading curator behind exhibitions, installations, and experiences that specialize in video games, play, and digital culture. She's co-founder and creative director of Good Afternoon, an experiential de design creative agency. Previously, she was curator of video games at the VNA, where she led the curation of the headline exhibition Video Games. She was guest director of Experimental Games Festival Now Play This at Somerset House, and co-founded the UK alter alternative video game collective The Wild Rumpus. Across her career, she's worked alongside a host of international organizations and leading cultural institutions, including the Smithsonian, ACMI, PlayStation, the Design Museum, Netflix, Channel 4, and Nintendo. Holly Nielsen is a historian, writer, and narrative designer based in London. She's currently completing her PhD at Royal Holloway University of London with a thesis which is entitled British Board Games and the Ludic Imagination circa 1860 to 1939. She's published a number of academic pieces about her research exploring topics such as geographies in 19th century board games, imperial preference in interwar British trade games, the depiction of the gendered experience in 20th century chance-based board games, and multi-purpose domesticity. Alongside her academic work, Holly's a game developer working as a writer and narrative designer for video games, and her latest work can be seen in the IGF Excellence in Narrative nominated game, Neurocracy. Before she pivoted to academia and games, Holly was a journalist and arts critic with bylines including The Guardian, The New Statesman, and Vice, amongst others. Dr. Michael Pennington is an associate lecturer in historical and critical studies at Bath Spa University in the UK. His main research interests explore the mounting challenges of game preservation and how history is uniquely portrayed and interpreted within video games. His PhD explores how history is curated and interpreted in Hearts of Iron 4, and he's also published work on the history of women's football and the FIFA series, and the importance of online wikis as video game paratexts. His current and upcoming research focuses on how video games uniquely curate, reflect upon, and preserve modern and contemporary Japanese history. And as a former digital cur curator, he led the National Video Game Museum's Animal Crossing Diaries Oral History Project, uncovering the personal stories of players of Animal Crossing New Horizons during the COVID-19 pandemic and times of unprecedented social isolation. So welcome to all of you. Thank you all for coming, um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So I'm going to start off, um, and I'm going to come to Holly for our first question, I think. Um, where, when, and how do players do history in relation to historical games? And so thinking here, what kind of activities they undertake that we might call history in a broad sense? What kind of practices would you draw our attention to? And, and maybe what are the most significant player interventions you've seen in terms of historical games and why? Yeah, um, so big question. <laughs> So I was I was thinking when I was looking through the questions, and of course my brain automatically goes to like games like Crusader Kings and Eve Online and things like that, where you have um, you know players creating their own uh, modifications to reflect history as they would like to see it, to make it more accurate to what what they believe should be more accurate. Um, that wasn't meant to sound as dismissive as it is. <laughs> um, and and yeah, so there's a huge around these games, particularly strategy games. There's a huge community that is consistently doing things like that. Um, I was thinking significant player interventions. Um, actually, no, I'll go back to to talking about uh, players in relation because a big one that I see is a uh, you know players creating their own wikis, uh, kind of creating their own documents in terms of kind of they're doing the kind of practice of history with uh, the kind of games as their source. Um, which can lead to interesting tensions between uh, the game itself and then the kind of player, uh, the play that happens with the game or the play that happens around the game. Um, I was thinking, yeah, significant player interventions. Um, yeah, as I was saying, you know, these big, huge strategy games often have a lot of those, but I was thinking this is probably really, I don't know, is it egocentrical to say significant to me? Because because I was thinking of what what really changed my perspective in terms of player interventions, and it was actually a um, a board game from the early twentieth century, um, like nineteen. I think we don't have the exact date, but it's around kind of nineteen sixteen, and it's like a really simple like fairy tale themed race game. You know, roll and move, roll a dice, move along place. You know, quite pretty, but nothing special in terms of its content. Um, However, the that particular one has uh, was owned by a child, 
uh, called Joan because she she wrote her name really big on the back of the board and then on the playing pieces she wrote um, mother and she wrote father, mother on one and father on another and that to me was just I mean first of all something you absolutely love to see in a, in an archive what a wonderful little glimpse into not just you know not just the game but talking about the play that happened with the game it kind of is so tantalizing of what it tells us and then what it doesn't tell us and what it shows that we just don't get looking from games about having the player involved um but yeah just that small child scribbling on a board game was a, it was is, has been hugely influential on my research and i think is yeah i use it a lot as an example of kind of the difference between the play and the game so yeah for me that's that's one of the most significant thanks Thank joan <laughs> That's that's a, that's a lovely example, and it? and it makes me think of those moments when you open a you know a secondhand board game or something, and you find like scorecards or something from the people that played it before, right? Yeah. Um, Michael, what are your thoughts on this? It's really funny that you've mentioned uh, about the scorecards just then, Nick, because that's the point I was going to make. But firstly, let me just say, a I'm really happy to be here alongside Liam, Holly, and Marie, two experts in the field. So I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. Um, but. I was just recently in Edinburgh and we did a, a big long trip, but on the way up to Edinburgh, I stopped off back at home um, to see my parents and we ended up having a game of, I uh, don't know if, um, I think, I, I assume it's quite popular, a game called Pass the Pigs. This little game where you, you've you got two little um, pig figurines, you shake them up in your hand, you chuck them on the table and however they land, you get a certain number of points. Um, and we sort of just rediscovered this while we were back at home and going through all the scorecards. We haven't played this game since probably I was maybe maybe early teens. Might That might even be too old. So but like these historical documents, again, their stories uh, and histories have their own rather than also talking about, you know, historical games that um, frame their world through history. I think these really personal stories are really interesting and unique to, to to talk about and I think that notion of how do players do history talking about it in the broadest possible sense I think is really instructive and foundational to how we understand play um, because you know what we're doing right now talking about play talking about player practices is also a form of player practice in itself in this weird sort of meta eating itself sort of idea that we are all players in some way played games but we have an enjoyment of it and enthusiasm for the the medium we end up you know having these academic disciplines and conferences when we discuss all these really interesting aspects about games so i think that yeah keeping it really broad is really interesting um it's great that um sort of talk about wikis as well i think i'll probably you know an opportunity to go in into talking more about wikis later because obviously i wrote something for for the blog on online wikis for Hearts of Iron 4, um, how players sort of occupy this interesting uh, space as well as like historians in their own right as well, or archivists as well, or curators. Um, so yeah, really interesting. But I think doing history in its broader sense is where we see like the personal, really personal, interesting hi histories coming through. Thank you very much. So lots of lots of personal emphasis here on from both directions, I think, which is which is really interesting and, and, and nice to hear. Uh, over to you, Marie, what do you think? I like this talking about doing history in the broadest sense, like the excuse of when you're sat down playing a game and someone's like, come on, could you help out or do something different? It's like, well, look, I'm doing history. This is important. Um, but yeah, like a lot of what everybody said has really sort of resonated and like, it was one of the first things I had written down in my notes as well. Um, but also really nice sort of people talking about this context of sort of house rules and the small ways that we adapt and modify games. Like I think it's easy sometimes to think about modern as this sort of very big sort of technical um, arduous sort of quite complicated process but realizing that it's something that everybody who's probably ever owned a copy of Monopoly has done in some extent that as soon as you start to lose the counters like the random sort of bric-a-brac from around the house that suddenly replaces the the things that you have or the small adjustments that you make to games sort of and how that how that builds up that sense of history and I think there's a really lovely display and I'm really annoyed that I can't remember what it's called that is um on show at the young VNA, which is the new um sort of re redeveloped or rebranded um museum of childhood um at the VNA, and it's a installation created by Holly Gramazio who's an artist and games designer and soon to be writer as well and it's sort of these these cards that she created originally for now play this festival 
And it was a way for attendees who were coming to the festival to write about and capture a specific way that they'd sort of modded or created a house version or house rules of a game. And people were just sort of posting little notes and sort of sharing those. And it's just this really nice small way of building up this big sort of collage of different sort of very personal histories and often sort of very memorable and um, relatable sort of experiences. Like for me, the, the one um, contribution or the contribution that I made to that was a game that me and my sister used to play when we were younger which we called slanty tetris um and it's a game where we used to have on the computer like a version of tetris which was two player slanty tetris was where you're playing tetris but you just put your head at a 45 degree angle and then you try and play which actually surprisingly adds an incredible difficulty curve to your sense of perception of where the drops were or where the blocks are coming down um so yes yeah, so i really like this idea of sort of house rules um and history that we're talking about and and also this idea of um and sort of wikis like the other thing that I wanted to sort of pick up on as sort of areas where I found it's really interesting to see people actively engaging with this sense of sort of history and sort of research um, was in some of the, when I was researching for the v &A exhibition, um, some of the history of Minecraft and how the history of Minecraft as a game is one that is so incredibly tied to the rise and the success of YouTube as well, of people creating their own, sort of recording their own playthroughs, recording their own play styles and posting those on YouTube. Um, and you can go back to what is, um, so I was digging around and trying to find sort of what were the most sort of early or significant videos of Minecraft on YouTube. And there's one which was um, sort of the first time this one sort of user recreates the, called Halcon, who recreates a Starship Enterprise in Minecraft, which felt like a real tipping point um, in terms of people's perceptions. But you can go all the way back to what people have perceived as being the first recorded evidence of somebody posting Minecraft to YouTube. And it's just none of the people in the and you look at the comments on this youtube video and in those comments there is such excitement from a fan base and a community who are not historians who were all sort of sharing about sort of um this is the first ever video that's on youtube um technically the first ever one doesn't exist anymore because it was taken down and it was posted by such and such but this is the longest one that's existed and there's just this really nice sense of um none of that sense of research or history sort of happening in a formalized sense it's just a very passionate fan base um sort of sifting through in these very contemporary spaces for that sort of that history that already exists or that that, that history that still exists and trying to sort of find and share that and is sort of excited by that so yeah those are the things that sort of initially came to mind um with a question for me Thank you. And I can see I've got sort of lovely connection there from this sort of like archival research that Holly's doing through to the sort of contemporary manifestation of those things that maybe will find themselves in the archive in the future, which is which is really interesting. And and, and teasing about that, that kind of idea of of what players are doing, particularly, I'm going to kind of move us on to our second question. And I'll start with with Michael for this one. Of course, you know, we can see player engagement as we're talking about is really critical to games. But what do you feel that the historical interventions that players make add to games themselves? So what, what kind of problems are you seeing with player engagement with history um, around like your own games, if you're a game maker or in fact any games? And when does this not work? So thinking about really sort of that relationship between the player additionality, maybe, or the player historical work um, and, and the game itself. It's a really good question. Um, I think for me, what sort of strikes me first is uh, leaning on the, some of the writing I've done about sort of wikis, like online wikis as these instructional um, artifacts, accessible artifacts as well, uh, that elucidate upon a game whilst existing outside of it. So in some senses that it a wiki does a lot of the work that may be a... Um, do you remember those little books that you used to get with a game called manuals and they don't, ex you know, these, these uh, very weird alien objects that we don't see anymore. Or if you, you know, only unless you buy a sort of special edition of a, of a game, do you get like these, you know, really well detailed um, documents, but online wikis are sort of, um, they're like a democratization of that platform, allowing players to all collaborate together on this open document. Um, and the, wiki that I wrote about for the um, Historical Games Network um, for Hearts of Iron, Hearts of Iron 4 wiki, is this really interesting um, living document that's still being changed now to um, add all the additional um, details that are being put into the game, all the historical or alt historical changes that are being added into Hearts of Iron 4. Hearts of Iron 4 being this 
sort of huge sprawling grand strategy game that includes um, histories of the Second World War, but also alternative imagined histories of, of that period and epoch. So in one sense, the wiki works on that level, uh, uh, where collabor uh, people collaborating on this sort of online document, sharing information about historical law, I guess, in some ways, or historical information. Um, the historical information sort of embedded within the game, but also if you look at some of the pages on Hearts of Iron 4 wiki, uh, one of the examples I think I speak about in my pieces about Japan, there's a lot of flavor text as well that doesn't, that it, that's not included in the game. That is direct historical writing and work that's being uh, contributed to by players. Um, so I think that's really interesting in one sense, because also it's sort of redefining the sort of um, interpretations that go on inside the game slightly. It's not the developers doing that work directly. Uh, but also, I think these objects are, and it sort of ties into a bit of what Mario was saying about Minecraft, tying into the history of this um, digital game as sort of a contemporary object. And that over the course of time, with these changes have been made to the system and all the different computations, computational changes that have gone on with different patches or hot fixes, they are also all documented in this, this wiki. Um, and that's also instructed. So in one, in one sense, we're talking about the wiki as a document that documents the history in the game, but also is the history of the game as a contemporary designed object, I guess, in some ways. Um, and that ties into how I sort of think about Minecraft in some ways, because, you know, the history of Minecraft for me stops when horses are introduced, because past that point, I've got no idea what when got added into Minecraft. But you, Minecraft is this really iterative experience and if we were trying to sort of define what minecraft is to everyone that would be uh it would be it, it would almost be a very personal experience and, and definition based on maybe a time that you've played it or a set of um systems within the game that exist or, or have been changed since then so i think that's why the wiki for me is something really interesting and i think one of the points that i like to make about like these documents is they're really open access. Uh, some of the work that I've done on sort of game preservation, um, we find that games become, you know, very alarmingly unplayable. Um, so we have these artifacts that still exist, that still tell us about play in some way and tell us about the game in some way. They're open to everyone. So I think that um, it's they're really interesting pieces to examine. And I think they shed a lot of light on the history of games, the work that players do as sort of historians, I guess, in some ways as well. Thank you. Yeah. And I, and also just, just as an aside, uh, picking out a single comment that you made, I love the idea that history ends when domestication of horses is introduced, which would make all of the civilization players very sad, I'm sure. Um, so handing that question over to, to you, Marie, um, so thinking about that relationship between what players do and what that adds to games. Yeah, and I think for me, sort of, and a lot of what sort of Michael's just touched on as well is how much the way that players engage with games sort of can often challenge the way that we take an approach to preservation or we think about conservation. And I think for me, it's something that I um, sort of come across when, when, as somebody who's worked in a museum and has sort of done research within sort of various other museum institutions that historically are sort of founded upon um, much more sort of material, tr sort of traditionally material, traditional material objects. Um, and knowing that video games are ephemeral, they're complex, but also that um, how much there's this sense, as we've sort of touched upon, there is a sense of dual authorship, um, sort of when we think about a game, that it's not necessarily just the game as intent. Like, I think sometimes with within museums, and especially, say, when you're coming from, say, an art context, there is this sort of historical <laughs> emphasis on the author, on the designer, on the artist, and what was their intention, and what was their focus. And sort of, it's not to say that this hasn't happened with other mediums, but that there is almost the thought that anything that sort of happens or the use or the purpose of that is almost sort of secondary or of lower value to the intention of the creator. Whereas I think sort of as we understand with video games and as we're sort of talking about with these player interventions that actually that hierarchy doesn't exist because there's sort of this very, we can have this very sort of holistic view of what we consider, um, what we consider sort of a video game to be um, in terms of the way that we can um, think about the work. And there's so many, so many sort of examples, um, sort of, um, sort of when I was 
I'm trying to think of which which direction to go in with which sort of game and also sort of referencing sort of Holly, I hope it's not too egocentric to talk about my own work. Um, the sort of one of the one of the recent recent projects of mine um, is a, a machinima documentary called The Grannies. Um, and this is a film which captures um, a specific moment where a group of players who are also games designers themselves and visual artists were playing the video game Red Dead Redemption 2. And when they were playing the game, they'd heard about this exploit from players online about how if you get to a certain part of the map and you get to a certain location, you can glitch your way outside of what is considered to be the playable boundary of the video game. And they they sort of collectively glitch outside of this space. And within this, they find this incredibly sort of um, abstract and surreal landscape that looks and resonates and sort of we can identify as being Red Dead Redemption and sort of the, the landscape of that game and that sort of uh, that sort of Wild West sort of landscape. But but it's all sort of fragmented and broken in slightly strange ways that sort of the, there's hyper real textures that clash there's walls of water that just sort of float in the air there's just sometimes ominous gray cubes floating um, and one of the grannies who um was one of the people who was part of that expedition that broke outside of bands that the film is about he talks about Gakodil McClart he talked about the stuff that they found outside of that space has been the hurricane of the games the, the wait he says it so much more eloquently, I'm going to misquote him, but it's it's the hurricane of, uh, or the debris of the hurricane of the game's development, that what you at first look at as being this incredibly sort of abstract and surreal landscape, you realise that the analogy I normally create or make is that it's almost look, looking at like when you turn over a piece of embroidery, on one side you see this really considered um, sort of finished piece, when you turn that over you can see sort of all of the knots and the directions and the decisions that hand has had to make about how where to go and how to... Um, how does how that work was created and it gives you such a much fuller idea of the materiality of that work of the humanity behind that work and i think for many many people understanding that craft and that humanity and that skill that goes into making games it's often sort of something that they don't sort of confront or that they're not sort of aware of um and so for me that's what that film is about is sort of opening that up but you only get that insight into that game from from that perspective about the way that that game world is made because red dead uh, red dead redemption and rockstar games are incredibly protective about the design and development of their works they will allow some stories to go out about how it's created but as with all big AAA companies and big studios they're very secretive and protective about the, the methods of production and so through that work through that act of play through their documentation of it they are providing this incredibly rare glimpse into the way that that game is made but they're also doing it by taking the sort of authorship of that history and putting it into the hands of themselves as players and there's there's other examples that i really love as well which i'll just quickly mention um is there's an article that was in um, an issue of Arcade Review years ago, and it was a, a person called Anj Patel who um, was looking at the source code of the video game Slave of God by Stephen LaBelle, and he was trying to understand, like, instead of having an interview or a discussion with Stephen, he was trying to understand the intentions of him as designer by just looking at the source code of the game, of looking at the folder structure, of looking at the way that the game had been created. And again, the thing that I really love about these examples is that they're a way of looking at the sort of history of the materiality of those games, looking at the intention of the author, but doing it from the perspective of um, players as opposed to from the artist, which I think can provide us with a much sort of, um, not necessarily greater narrative, but I think it provides us, provides us with a much, much broader perspective on the way that games are made. So I think for me, sort of, those are sort of examples of the way that that work can really challenge the way that we might approach preservation and conservation and that hierarchy that we might sort of value within it. Thank you. And I can see how, I mean, from, you know, Michael's point about the player as historian coming through again here in, 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 in that part of the discussion and just the ways in which you're, you're talking about those materials. And again, I'm thinking about the process of archival research and, and the way in which we sort of, we almost do that job when we are, when we're, let's say, researching an author, you know, we're looking at what the, like what the author's life was like and the things the author did as a way to try and understand what they made. Uh, Holly, what do you think? Um, I was wondering about whether this is now the time to bring up my controversial uh, game dev <laughs> opinion, <laughs> which, yeah, sure, this will fit. So basically, I made a, a, a short twine game, kind of interactive fiction vignette um, for the Historical Game, ne uh, game Network, Network blog uh, for this called You're Ruining My Law, which is basically about um, 
my dislike of law and exploring that <laughs> and what I mean by that and again this is a very personal thing you know this is this is not me saying you know ah this is the correct way of doing this because there is no correct way um but for me personally something I've of, I've observed both having been a games journalist and then watching players and then uh now being a game dev myself is I really don't like law as a thing I I see I see law as often um or at least the kind of act of law as often oh how do I say, <laughs> say this without well how do I soften it by saying is it, it can be it can simplify history to the point that it's reductive but also in that it is counter to what history is um, so when people say law, and it's not necessarily law itself, what law has come to mean or what the kind of act of law is, is now kind of often seen as this kind of like unchanging tome, like the law is the solid thing and everything is built off that law is, you know, and and sometimes it can, uh, you you know, you kind of see players by wikis trying to um, uh, negotiate and trying to, you know, fill in the gaps and fill in their law. And, um, and I think there is a, you know, this is a form of history in and of itself, but it also adds to the question of, um, you know, when it comes to law, you know, there's a famous thing that all historians would have heard a million times and everyone else, you know, you know, you can't rewrite history, which of course we all know is nonsense, because if we can't rewrite history, then a lot of us here are out of a job. <laughs> and, you know, that's that you, you should rewrite history. History is meant to be re rewritten. It is a human created thing, um, a subjective thing that should constantly be updated and revisited and all of that. Um, and so, yeah, this idea of law that at the bottom of it all, there is this solid thing. There is this thing that is, you know, this is it. And trying to, I just, I don't know, it, for me, for me, I guess for me as a narrative designer, I find it quite um, restrictive in terms of, and yeah, and you kind of see kind of conversation of canon and betraying canon and, and all of that. And and yeah, and although it also has this idea of kind of, you know, oh, what does a historian do? And, you know, I remember when I was first starting history, the way it was often sold to us to try and get, you know, young people into history would say, oh, well, you're like a detective trying to find out the past, blah, blah, blah. And actually, as you go a lot, you're not a detective <laughs> trying to find the past. There is not an, you know, yes, there are aspects you're trying to find in an archive, but the idea, you know, the further, further you go along in education, the more you question, you know, this kind of idea of objective truth and this idea that there is this you know this thing that you're reaching for that you're digging for and you'll find it and that's it and uh you know and then all conversations are done because we found it and um isn't that wonderful um and so yeah and so i i i see yes so so sometimes i see when when uh the kind of discussions that can happen um from players and also from devs in terms of you know obviously as a developer you will often have your you know your world bible you'll have your your thing that you're building off a part of me thinks it's very boring just to give that to the player like what is you know the whole point of narrative design is not what is said but how is the player receiving this information you know how the player is receiving the information should tell them just as much as the information itself um, in an ideal world, obviously, you know, every game is different. And so if you're just kind of transferring from one wiki to another, that's, you know, where's the where's the fun in that? And I remember John Ingold um, gave a really great talk and he described um, a lot of game narrative as being this kind of Sudoku idea, like Sudoku narratives, where, you know, there is a complete picture in there somewhere and the player is piecing together, but there are right places for this information to go. Um, and again, that can be hugely rewarding. It can be done really well. Um, you know, the big one that everyone always says is, you know, the Dark Souls games are from software games of, did you know that the lore is in the item descriptions? <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what you're talking about in history of games, that will always get brought up. Um, and I think there's actually, I, I won't go on a tangent there because I'll be going on for too long, but I think a lot of the tension, which I find really interesting in that particular example, is that it's material culture, but translated material culture to words. And so I think a lot of the tension is then trying to like, how do you display material culture in a game where you are then telling the information via, um, via, by words and so it's not actually material culture, it's, it's, it's a broken up codex with something connected and but yeah, so it's there's all kinds of interesting ways to do it, but I just guess from my perspective, both as a historian and I think sometimes it can influence people in terms of how they perceive history in general, 
this idea of law and this idea of there being a you know an ultimate truth at the bottom of it i think it can be quite harmful in terms of how people engage with history in terms of how people think about history um you know i'm not saying that you know people creating wikis for games they love is is you know is 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 terrible and oh it, people don't understand history and xyz um but I think there are questions to be had around it. And so there's the, yeah, as I said, uh, before I repeat myself, from my own kind of very personal perspective as a narrative designer, I can find it quite restrictive and, you know, dare I say it, quite boring. Um, and then as a historian, a lot of, yeah, I, I, I think it throws up a lot of um, interesting questions. Thank you. And I, you're making me think there of the sort of the connection between assembling the law in in a sort of completed way almost like completing a game right if you and 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 we we wouldn't probably make that analogy with this we wouldn't say talk about completing history although we you do obviously find people who think they're writing the history of something rather than a history of it and i i guess law is, is similar in that respect i think the thing i always liked about it is the way it or, or the way in which fans particularly will will sort of work in the gaps between the information and law, because that's the thing for me that that feels very historical. That uh, particularly as a medievalist by background, that kind of we know basically nothing, so let's fill the space in with with something that seems plausible vaguely. And I, I always like that about about law. But yeah, absolutely, it, it can be a quite a, a contentious space. I wanted um, to just append oh. sort of follow or follow up from what Holly was saying because. I know we talked about this before that sort of when Holly was talking about law, it's funny, my brain does go to sort of from software, but the other game that my brain goes to is Animal Crossing. Um, and for me, like the thing I was jokingly going to say, like one of the laws that I do really love on the wikis is reading about how over the history of those games, people have tried to figure out the relationship, this sort of melodrama that's happened amongst the hedgehogs within that game. Like, what's the relationship? There's a missing sister that's coming. But, but, it made, but thinking about that, just when Holly was speaking about this idea of there being this sort of one sort of consistent idea of law and that there's this one history which again i think is what one of the really sort of great sort of reflecting on what i was saying before about how triple a game studios sort of create this sort of that there is this worry about creating this sort of more mythologized sort of history of how what a game is where players can contest that but but in regards to animal crossing and wikis it reminds me of like this anecdote that i had and it wasn't from the last release new horizons it was from the one the game before new leaf um, and it was one of the things at the time that I, when I was playing the game, one of the things that I really got into was, and I think a lot of people also got into it in New Horizons, was the idea of um, cross-pollinating flowers. And there's this, um, I was trying during New Leaf um, to create sort of the ultimate, sort of the, the purple rose, which was almost, was it a purple rose? It might have been the blue, no, was it a blue rose? Blue rose or purple rose? One of those two colors. Um, and, and trying to figure out how to do it. And what was really interesting is going on all of the wikis, going on all of the fan sites, it was the one thing about that game. It was the one thing in terms of fan and sort of player created information where there was no definitive answer that was available online. And no matter which wiki I went to, no matter which blog I went to, no matter which Reddit thread I followed down, everybody had got slightly different ideas about the way that you sort of had to align the roses. And it's obviously so it's like this great example of um, I think the terminology is like theory crafting or something where people are trying to not understand necessarily the law of the narrative but they're trying to see through the game to see how the systems are working like what is the logic of the game and how is this actually created to um to, to lead me to this conclusion and it was it was the one thing that after playing that game for sort of made it for a long time after feeling like i'd sort of was getting to like i've exhausted as much as i could it was this one area that i became really sort of interested and curious about because because it was that one space where nobody could agree on what the truth was and so you end up with this really sort of interesting space where you have all of these different conflicting reports and history across the wikis and so it was that one sense that it's not quite sort of we're not not law sort of in that narrative sense but that idea of like actually this is an area of the game which is which is remaining defiant and refusing to be categorized in this definitive way um but yes yeah, so that's just one of the things i was thinking of when holly was talking that's a fantastic example. Thank you. Um, and, and I think that really like, plays into the discussion very well, uh, particularly that the messiness of history, right? The the the, the fact that actually, uh, you know, to come back to your earlier point, Holly, almost the, the sense that we like to imagine we can know stuff about the past, but actually we maybe we don't really know anything. Um, and, and, and you know, and, and we just we're, we're telling a story effectively. Right. Um, so I'm going to move us on to our next question. Before I do, just to say to the audience, if you've got questions for the panel, stick them in the chat um, and we'll come to those um, after uh, 
one or two more questions um, for the, for the group. Um, so I'm going to start with a question to Marie next, um, and actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up on a on a thread that came out there that you started to talk about a bit, Marie, about the sort of place of this in 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 museums. Now, all of you have inv been involved in some way or other with the past of games themselves, either within the context of working with archival materials, working with museums and other spaces traditionally associated with preservation and exhibition. So, where do player practices sit? in this discussion and how do we manage the tension between preserving the game and preserving the player you know can we even separate the concept of game and player here yeah i think that was um that was the thing that i was sort of curious to talk about i feel like we've kind of talked about it a little bit that this idea of the, um there being sort of the game and their idea this idea of there being the player and I think for me, it sort of all comes back to um, the way that when when I was working with music, when I was working within the Vienna, and you're working within an institution, that there's this idea that you can um, you can potentially push to find the definitive work, the definitive object. Like what is what is the thing that sits at all the heart at the heart of um, the material, the object that we are seeking to display? Um, and I think that sort of desire and that approach feels to me that it's very tethered and embedded in um, sort of tactile and sort of um, traditional material culture um, that is not digital, which is more fixed, it's more sort of physical, that it's sort of like a known object. It's not to say that that is, that there are not similar complexities historically about defining what an object is and objects being interactive, but I think video games and digital culture just pushes so many of the parameters of that to such an nth degree that we can see where all of these sort of concepts and assumptions that we've been working with begin to break down. And for me, it was this sort of concept that when when we were exhibiting video games in the VNA and we were looking at works to bring into the exhibition, that it was like this idea that um, you can be like, well, we're going to exhibit ten games, um, and what are those ten games? So the, the the show didn't exhibit ten games, but just hypothetically, and and okay, well, one of those games can be sort of Bloodborne. How are we going to exhibit Bloodborne? And if you follow that line of thinking, the thing that you potentially get to is this idea of like, well, Bloodborne as a playable game within that space. That is the thing. That is the definitive object that surely we're working towards. Um, but when you, you you begin to pick that apart because you think, well, when we're exhibiting Bloodborne, um, this is a game that could potentially take sort of up to 60 hours to really be sort of understood or perceived. It's also a game that like exists um, with multiple different updates. Which version of Bloodborne are we bringing into this space? Um, are you playing this on a console? Are we playing this on a computer? Or is this going to be on a screen? Is this going to be on a projector? And the more you dig into it, the more you begin to see all of these variables that of all of these things that begin to define what that concept or what we agree that that game is sort of um a, a sort of overall but it's not just about the physicality of that game whether we're talking about it sort of um through sort of physical whether we're talking about or the materiality of that game whether we're talking about that physically or digitally it's also understanding the context that the player comes to that game within because it's thinking that, okay, if you come to Bloodborne and you play this, but you're somebody who has no experience playing video games, you will have a very different experience playing that game than somebody who's very um, sort of well-versed in that. If you play that game at home on your couch by yourself, you will experience that game very differently than if you are coming into a museum and into an exhibition and you are stood at a podium and you've paid X amount for your ticket and you've got to get off for lunch and you've got 10 minutes and I'm just going to play this with hundreds of people watching me in the background. And all of that is to say that there's this whole other set of variables that meets with all of those variables of the game. And that, that context about the person, about who they are, about their history, about their experiences, about what mood they're in, all dramatically changes what the game is that ex is experienced in that moment. And so for me, like the ultimate thing is sort of that, look, there is no one concept of a game that we can ever sort of agree on. We can have sort of a broad consensus of what we think a game might be, but instead, um, instead we have to, when we dig into it, realize actually there's all of these many different iterations because no one game will ever be experienced by two people the same way. No one person, when they pick up a game, will experience it the same way twice. Um, so what actually is that game? And it gets into this space where you're sort of pulling your hair apart and thinking as a curator, well, how on earth do we exhibit it if this game exists in multiple, like almost infinite different states? And it's like, hey, it doesn't matter because what we what our role is as curator, it doesn't matter. This is where it's interesting because this is where our role of a curator is looking at that work and understanding, well, what is it about this that I'm trying to communicate or convey? And that is the approach that I will take. And it can skew towards um, 
And so coming back to the first question, can you separate the game from the player is, is yes, you can, you can separate those two things, but it can only be done with the awareness that you are creating a separation. But there's this whole muddy gray area in between um, because there is no, ultimately there is no concept of what that game is without the player. And there's never through those two points ever sort of one version of what that game is. Thank you. And and I can see that, again, that sort of the question of the the, the variety of materials and, 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 and that connection to, I suppose what I'm trying to say, connection to the things that players do really, really not only change the character of the game, but but change, as you say, the sort of the, the way we can even think about it as a, as a thing. And, you know, thinking about all of those museum spaces where they've got exhibits of this is a board game from ancient egypt for example and we, we have you know we, we, we might not even know how this was played we might not even know who played it and and that, that becomes a challenge for us i guess as, as historians more generally holly the archivalness of games right i mean thinking about because my sense has always been that archives are very sort of thingy about games you know they put a game board in and that's the game right so, mm -hmm. so how, how does this play out in your own work um yeah, I had a million thoughts going through my head when Marie was talking there. So, so many interesting points. Um, yeah, one of the things I'm particularly doing my PhD um, research is actually trying to locate the player and locate the player as best I can, which is, it's difficult to do even when your players aren't long since passed. <laughs> so it's very difficult to do when this play happened, you know, 100, 120 years ago. Um, and so, and so how to go about that? Because the thing is, is like, I think for me personally, I completely agree with Marie where you can separate the, the game and the play are interconnected, but different things. And so, and I think sometimes the intention of the designer is taken as the play that happens with the game, where obviously we have no idea. We have absolutely no idea. <laughs> you know, the designer could have intended X, Y, Z. Did the players take that away? No idea. Have uh, you know? Unless, unless you know. And I think sometimes there's that's where, um, in at least in the academic research of games, um, we we don't have a huge amount of really in depth ethnographic player studies. Um, and I think we sometimes have a bit of a habit for saying games are great at X Y Z or games do X Y Z, and uh, and then kind of taking a step back and going. Do we have evidence that they do that? Do we have it's it's the kind of the classic thing I saw people talking about, um, you know, games making people violent. And people go, no, 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 games don't make people violent. And then we'll talk about games for good. And I go, oh, well, games are great because they influence uh, behavior. And I'm stuff like, that's let's see, are we gonna have we can't we can't pick it, we can't cherry pick which one of these. And um, that's why the Animal Crossing, uh, Michael's work for the Animal Crossing, um uh kind of creating that archive of players is so amazing because that, that not a lot that really doesn't exist in many ways um one of my own my own research I use a lot of um uh oral histories that were done in the kind of 60s and 70s that were done by sociologists and they were not about play uh they were about their lives in general uh focusing on their childhood but then going on I think because it was childhood they do ask a bit about play but it's not the focus um, and at least for what I'm wanting to do with my PhD research, which is to get this much more holistic understanding of the role of play in people's lives, um, that's that's really essential for that. Because if they if you go to the section of the oral histories where they just ask about the play, you'll see. Um, so, for example, the big one that comes up is they'll be asked, um, oh, where did you play? And nearly all of them will say, we only played outside. We only played on the street. We only played outside. That was where we played. If you go to other sections, if you read the full thing, um, you'll see they say, oh, well, on Sunday, uh, we would play board games with, um, you know, my grandparents, blah, blah, blah. And oh, actually, you know, in the winter, we would do X, Y, Z. And actually kind of unwrapping these things through as a perspective of their entire lives, it's much more complicated and much more kind of intertwined. And so, and I think that's, that's and that's a really difficult thing to do because I've had a few people ask of like, oh, well, how do we capture these kind of really, and I was like, you have to ask them about everything <laughs> because it comes up in the most, if you're trying to get this really big kind of more broader sense of, I would, what I would give to have a study like Michael's on about on chess or something like that, that would be incredible. What I would, you know, future historians are going to absolutely love that. Um, but in terms of getting the kind of broader holistic sense, it's so difficult because the reason it works is because they ask about everything. They ask about how many, it comes up a lot when people ask about, um, 
how many rooms were in the house that you grew up in things that and and stuff and there'll be these little bits and pieces there and so yeah you have to look at this as an entirety and even then there'll still be lots of bits and pieces missing um and so yeah and so there's been at least in my own research there's been just there is a huge gap between designer intention and the play that actually happened with these games um because there's all these fascinating you know old board games that are like you know these kind of really hyper imperialist games or these educational games and like all these ones where as a you know as a researcher you're just like oh wow there is so much to unpack here um and so I've had a few people you know people when people ask about my research they say oh does that mean that people you know did xyz or they learned xyz and I have to say I don't know <laughs> I have no idea I, I cannot tell you if that's the case because I don't have um I don't have the right kind of uh sources to get a good kind of player study on that background and um so yeah, I saw it a lot when Animal, again, this is a very Animal Crossing, <laughs> but when Animal Crossing first came out, there was loads of these really brilliant um, think pieces um, about uh, Animal Crossing as um, enacting, being either colonialist or anti-colonialist and how people, and it was really interesting because I was seeing people saying, oh, players view Animal Crossing as X, Y, Z. And it was before Michael's wonderful, um, you know, research. So there wasn't the, and, and I, and, and it's it's that thing of it's a bit like the difference between analyzing the thing itself and then I use um the history of reading as a good example of kind of what what play trying to get at play like it's um you know the history of reading is very different from the books that were read even though they're intertwined um and so yeah and so there's 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 all these fascinating analyses of these games can we say that this is what players take from them. You don't know until you ask. You don't know until you do a really big study. And so that's where the, I think sometimes that's where there's a bit of tension or difficulty. Thank you. And yeah, you just make me think of the way in which, you know, we're often not even talking about the same thing as well. You know, the reading example would be a great one. If you say to somebody, do you read? You'll get remarkably different answers and you might have a different interpretation of those. So there's a thing I do with with students where I sort of talk about, say, okay, so who, who plays games? And, you know, like half the hands in the group will go up and I go, oh, okay, so you don't play phone games and then you'll get a sheepish room or well, maybe I play phone games. Do you ever watch quiz shows with your friends and kind of see who can get to get, get the answer first? Oh yeah, okay, I do that. And quite rapidly, you know, you can find a, a place of play for everybody, but people assume that they, they, they don't do that. So yeah, that, exactly that. I can see how that works perfectly. Michael? As, as a former curator yourself, back to you. <laughs> Holly and Marie have made so many good points. I've been scribbling furiously in my little notebook. Uh, one of the things that I've sort of circled about three times is like being the history detective. That was never pitched to me when I did uh, GCSE history, but I feel like I should start just in like Columbo and maybe that'll help my historical uh, practice as well. Um, I think I've just got some sort of reflections to build on really, like uh, separating... Uh, the notion of sort of game and the player in a sort of uh, curatorial space or an exhibition space, I think is um, something that can be and should be done because obviously play is obviously one way of experiencing the medium, going to go to the National Video Game Museum or going to the V&A and playing something. But as sort of Marie pointed out, there's all these variables that we have to consider, all the wear and tear that you have with these objects. Are you going to be using like uh, the the original system, the original controllers? Are you going to be using uh, emulation, that sort of murky area to make sort of uh, some some older games maybe load up quicker so more people can use it in a gallery space? There are like these really practical questions that need to be considered that make play um, more difficult to achieve in that space. Like again, like a, a JRPG that takes about 100 plus hours to play what moment of that do you select if you're going to be exhibiting that in a space do you have a load st a save state already prepared for someone to go to or do you just have it playing from the start so these like considerations like are really practical and make having sort of playable spaces and interactive spaces quite difficult um for just like just sitting down and playing a game not to mention all the sort of context that you have by being in a museum and not being at home um but I think that being able to separate the two, game and player, so player practice is social history. And I think that the Animal Crossing Diaries project that we worked on at the National Video Game Museum um, shortly after, I'm trying to think, 2021, although time time's weird, it, I think it, ends, it could be 2022 now and I've, I've, I've totally missed the wrong year. But um, 
sort of collating people's experiences of play through Animal Crossing, through um, these, uh, well, in a UK context, sort of fluctuating periods of social isolation. The, the, we sort of sent out an open call um, to the world to you know, send us their um, experiences of play, experiences of Animal Crossing in whatever way they chose. So we had lots of really creative um, submissions, actual like diary entries that were written out in handwriting. Or uh, I remember one entry was a sort of musical piece, which sort of uh, <laughs> is this cacophony of, of cute noise, but uh, uh, the notes were registered on, um, they were like transposed from where the stork market rates were. <laughs> so the stork market being an Animal Crossing version of the stock market where you could make millions of Animal Crossing coins or storks by by, by buying and selling storks. Um, it's, it's very interesting to talk about these abstract things in that way. Um, but the Animal Crossing Diaries, like, um, you know, how we had keeping routine, but how players were able to ha keep up with this routine during lockdown when, you know, maybe they were furloughed or something like that. Um, uh, ways of like uh, representing yourself, you know, we in it, quite big news items as well, sort of political campaigns being sort of done on Animal Crossing. I've, I'm pretty sure there was something to do with um, uh, the Democratic sort of US um, government doing some sort of uh, event on Animal Crossing, but also like having um, stuff like Pride, events like Pride happening on people's islands. Um, but also some, some of the things were really like emotive and personal, like people losing loved ones during the pandemic and then having sort of like commemoration gardens in Animal Crossing. Um, and these are like really heartfelt um, stories, um, histories of people during this time. And Animal Crossing makes uh, and and sort of the sort of toy box sort of framing of Animal Crossing in that sort of really cute anthropomorphized desert island makes those um, the framework for those stories to come out. Um, so yeah, in that sort of curatorial space, the notion of going through player practice is a really um, emotive and interesting way of talking about play and talking about games. Um, yeah, I have some other notes sort of talking about how like players also sort of subvert play as well and how that is part of player practice. So I don't know if it sort of leans into some of the stuff that Holly was talking about, about law, but like the notion, the the in, the uh, relationship between law and fan fiction and that subverting of a law that's been created by the designer is then being reinterpreted by fans Um through sort of fan fiction, I wonder if that's an, an, another sort of crucial part of how we sort of think about um, not maybe uh, representations of the past, but representations of like our present also being our own histories as well. Thank you. And Sorry. yes, Holly, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I want to jump in as well. Holly, you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, just Michael said something that just is such an important, at the very beginning, such an important point that suddenly I was like, oh, of course. Um, in terms of talking about uh, the games and the player, is that not all games are played. Um, and so um, I I wrote a chapter for, uh, oh God, I'm going to forget the name of the book, which is bad, uh, about materialism and board games. But I uh, wrote a chapter, which was um, an important part of that, which was about, um, it was three case studies of board games produced throughout the 20th century in Britain, which study, uh, which looked at um, the gendered experience and they were purely through chance-based board games. Um, and so, uh, and at least two of them were not really, I would argue they were not intended to be played. They were using game as metaphor. Um, and so, and to be glanced at, and one of them is very obviously like a, a, an item of protest, uh, which wasn't really designed to be played. Like it was kind of more of a, it's more of a kind of um, a, a kind of political scream. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and again, we could get into arguments of, well, oh, well, what is play? And then what is player? If it's, you know, is glancing over this and looking at it and understanding the metaphor of a chance-based game, is that play in and of itself? But but I think for that is 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 really important of understanding what actually happened with these games, you know, because the designer intention, because again, some of these games, I would, at least one of them, designer did not intend it to actually be played. 
because it's a one-off uh it's a handwritten uh one-off game that she made as a kind of almost like a kind of protest kind of placard-esque thing um it's a it's a metaphor to to be understood um so yeah so yeah I just thought that was yeah that just what Michael was saying just really reminded me I was like okay not all games are played <laughs> games aren't yeah not all that you know they had to understand whether whether they were actually understood in that way is is the first step in and of itself and yeah. also, of course, that idea that not all games are played properly as well, right? Because every, oh, every yeah. time we were talking about board games and children, I'm just thinking, and they were just throwing oh. stuff to the right rather. Than, and <laughs> oh yeah, there's no, there's a yeah. I cannot tell you how most of these games were played because, because yeah. Uh, yeah, as Marisa, the, the the thing of Monopoly and house rules and all of that, it's you know, I do not. I can tell you what the designer intended to the play to be. Yeah. I cannot tell you what the play was that happened with it. Yeah, and I think that sort of that hopefully sort of segues into the point that I was hoping to make, sort of following on, and hopefully quickly because I know the time and um, and questions. But it was around sort of thinking about sort of the way that specifically in the context of exhibiting games. And for me, there's a fallacy that I think that we have when we're thinking about exhibiting games that there is all the, the notion of interactivity that games are interactive means that they have to be playable to be present within the space. And that's something that I sort of really strongly challenge. That the only way to experience or to consider a game as being present is, is that it's been interactive. And I think a really great um, analogy for me that I look towards in my practice is thinking about games more through the lens of performance. And that equally gives us so much more space to look towards the way the performance is exhibited, the way the performance is archived, the way the performance is captured. And there's some really fascinating stuff that happens sort of within that space. But for me, it sort of, um, it opens when you look at the way that performance is captured, because they know that, like, if we're looking at the theatre and performance department at the VA, they can't capture a singular performance um, because it doesn't it doesn't really it, it exist, but it exists momentarily. It's like you have this framework, you have the script, you have the sort of intention of how it's performed, um, you have the audiences. So again, you have all of these variables, and so instead they look at this much more sort of holistic approach of collecting and and exhibiting that work. And um, for me, it sort of leans into this idea of when we think about when we're thinking about what is the game and when is it when is it present and when is it not and for me I get into this almost sort of philosophical space of saying that um like uh, when Michael's talking about the collections of the Animal Crossing diaries it's like well that for me when you exhibit that you are exhibiting Animal Crossing you are exhibiting that game that is not necessarily more or less valid than having a playable or interactive version of that and that notion of performance as well leads us into thinking well when we're exhibiting games interactively we are creating a space that fosters the opportunity for that performance and so what does it mean with how we define how we design and how we curate a space what are the resulting performances that will come out of that and how does that impact the way that we as curators intend somebody to take a message away from it it might be that actually what we want to do is show them a specific specific historical performance from that game and so say the example of the grannies is a really sort of valid one where it's like okay well this is a really significant historical version but there's also a really interesting space for thinking about choreography within games when we're thinking about exhibiting or preserving, when you have sort of people performing games live, when you have sort of archivists or people capturing recordings of games to sort of make notes, they're all playing in very intentional ways that are showing a really specific version of what that game is. So for me, instead of trying to hone into this one idea of like, what is what is the, what is the game like? And thinking about this fallacy of interactivity, meaning that it has to be directly interacted with by an audience member is not the right, it's, that, that's the fallacy. Instead, it's thinking, I think there's so much freedom if we think about it as performance and we think about all of those different variables um and each of those variables being a valid way of expressing that work yeah and i can i mean we, we sort of come back to that connection to to the thought about reading and and, uh, and michael's point earlier about preservation because you know that kind of idea that you need the original console or something or the original game experience you think well we, we wouldn't do that with a jane austen novel right we wouldn't say well you have to read this in a leather-bound book sat in a stately home by a fire you know, so we, we, we've sort of th those individualized experiences and, and actually that connection to time and space that we've been talking about as well become become really important. I'm going to take us on to the audience questions. I know we, we had some more kind of other questions we might discuss, but actually we've got some really interesting ones from the audience. So I'm going to pick some of those up. So sort of dip in whatever order you fancy in response to these. Um, but to start with, we've got a question from Russell Shanks. Um, this really picks up on some of the earlier parts of the discussion. Uh, how important is the player's own context in terms of approaching wikis or mods developed by other players? Who fancies that? I, I'll start. Go for okay. it. That's a great question. Um, I think 
it's almost unless it's like unless they have an explicit manifesto of their own context or where they're coming from you you don't you don't know what a player's own context is if, if you're approaching a wiki because a wiki is obviously this very uh democratic um document that you can just edit just like a normal sort of if we just imagine a wikipedia page in the in the broadest instance like we don't know the intention we don't know the context so then that leads into really like important issues there regarding like what type of interpretation it is coming uh the perspective of that interpretation um so unless yeah unless i don't know unless it's specifically from the developer we we can't we can't know that type of intention which i think is really interesting and i think that does tie into like mods as well like mods being created for specific purposes the the one that springs to mind for me mod wise is kaiserreich again it's for a sort of heart of iron 4 but it's imagining a uh alt history what if germany won the first world war and imagining the world from there and th this this mod has its own wiki as well i was looking through it just yesterday to to, to for some sort of research and it's this very detailed alternative history that Im so imagines some a different scenario for players to engage in um but yeah i think the crux of that is like we don't know the intention so it raises some really important questions there just as a note on mods as well though it reminded me there was a really interesting um a project that i really loved which didn't come from sort of a, a sort of historic historian background but it was a project by um alice o'connor who writes for rock paper shotgun and what she used to do was she collected an archive and it was a tumblr of readme files from mods and without the content of the mod like the readme file within of itself that is like sort of because then you can't necessarily know that. I think there are ways, and there, there is sometimes sort of debris and materials that I think provides really fascinating insight into the intentions of the designer because it's that like it's, it's almost like that, that, that sort of informal language or the way that they write about it or the tone is just such a compelling way of archiving or thinking about and collecting mods. And so it was just really great. It was just a really riveting sort of tumbler to sort of scour through because Alice is somebody who plays and is sort of very very well versed in sort of the history of um of that sort of space and is somebody who was picking out some really fascinating interesting and often hilarious sort of readme files and just it's really interesting to just look at and evaluate a mod and a game in the creator but just gaining as the insight the insight that you can gain from that just purely from reading the readme file and the instructions and just how how you can kind of hear that little bit of a manifesto but the amount of emphasis and intention that comes through from that document which um which i thought was just when we're talking about mods is a really interesting um really interesting approach for that for me yeah, I'm going to I'm going to quickly do a very shameless plug um, about if you're interested in wikis and uh, um, and the kind of intention behind them. So Neurocracy, the game that was mentioned before um, that I wrote for for its second run, um, it's a kind of live ARG game, but it also exists afterwards as this kind of um, uh, the yeah, it's interesting. You can go. It's free. It's online. Uh, look at it. But basically, the whole point is it's a future Wikipedia style game, and it's updated weekly. And you see the changes in the wiki, and you're trying to figure out. There's a main kind of um, you know, mystery at the heart of it, but also just there's all this stuff floating around. And one of the really, one of the reasons I really loved working on that game was this idea of um, hidden intentions behind any kind of edit. Like, what does it mean to re remove a uh, a possessive apostrophe there? Like, what does that say? That very particular thing, um, and all those, you know, all those little edits and what comes through in terms of intention of okay well why you know there's a reason why someone is here <laughs> doing this you know someone doesn't just fall into a wiki <laughs> and maybe they do I don't know that maybe that'll come up in future neuroxy updates but um yes so so yes yeah, so if there is something you're interested in then it's called um if you want to look it up online just type in omnipedia and then it's it looks like a wikipedia type and it's it's all there but yeah if you're interested in that <laughs> that's such a good point because that reminds me of um like whenever you read the the change log of any wikipedia page it's and fascinating you get this incredibly fascinating it's history crazy. of that discourse and the discussion and i think i can't remember which artist it was um that did the that there was an artwork where they published they printed out a book which was the change log for the wikipedia page for the iraq war i know mm. we're not talking about video games here but it's like that as a way of capturing the discussion about like just you you think that the page in itself is telling you the history where actually 
the change log tells you it's such a such a sort of incredibly yeah. rich history and then you realize the politics as well at the platform that that history is told through as well and yeah so like yeah change logs are really fascinating it was absolutely when i was approached to write for it i was like um because I was approached um, because of uh, my background in history. Um, and I was told, you tell, like, I get to tell a story via change logs and passive aggressive footnoting. I've been in academia. I was born for this. <laughs> it's, like, this, is, this is what I've been doing for 10 years. <laughs> and, 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 and those points that you're making as well, right, about the, the way in which this is, because it represents something else, right? It represents something else about how we sort of produce knowledge and how we understand the world. And I think your point, Marie, as you say, it's not games, but but it kind of is actually because we sort of gamified so much about war and, you know, and there's that longstanding relationship anyway, but also the ways in which kind of contemporary representations of war kind of get caught up on things like gaining perspectives from first person shooters and things like that, which, you know, just ways of representing things which have, which have changed. So I think that's that's a really kind of important connection. And I, I was going to ask you to plug the game anyway, Holly, so you did it. So that's good. That worked well. Um, so the next question is from Alex Alvarez Silva, and I'll, I'll try and fill it because it's quite a long question. But the core point is that um, Alex has been looking at um, the written fictions that some civilization players have produced from their after action reports and was hoping to find the ways that players would break away from game assumptions about history. And, you know, there's there's a sort of quite a lot of writing about civilization, this sort of contentious um, embedded colonialism potentially or, or, or problematic histories that it produces. But Alex is saying that even the most creative writing seemed to struggle to move away from the game's ideas about history, which has led to him questioning himself as to how much players actually do exercise their own autonomy in front of game design to build their own historical understanding. Do you think most players actually re-elaborate the game history ideas from their own perspectives, or are they mostly concerned with filling the gaps and reinforcing the game's historical presentation? Open to anyone. Holly, go for it. Um, so civilization is endlessly fascinating uh, for all the reasons that Nick said and more. Um, I think and without I mean I can't really say without actually looking at the player you know uh, the things that they've written I think civilization is interesting in terms of it's it's coming especially more recently it's really uh, finding tension in that I think a lot of um, games particularly strategy games are finding where it doesn't matter the history you put into that game the, the game itself is a statement on history um, so like they had the whole tension when they introduced the Cree leader Poundmaker and um, first of all, they didn't consult with uh, the current leaders of the Cree and represent representatives, which is always a bad idea if you're aiming to represent <laughs> represent an indigenous group or any group. Um, but, um, you know, we could say, OK, well, they're trying to broaden their roster of leaders and all of that. But actually, um, the, the game itself, the systems of the game itself are a historical statement in and of themselves. And so it doesn't matter what you place in it. It doesn't matter what you place on top of it. At its very core, it's going to have this thing. Um, and so, yeah, it's actually really interesting to hear that players are struggling to get away from that. And actually, I would say that's a research, that's a that's a that's a fascinating research topic in and of itself of of hearing um, if how players are interpreting this kind of very Whiggish, very kind of um, problematic idea of history when it comes to particularly you know histories of science and cultural social histories with yeah. the the bane of kind of um, the tech tree um, uh, and things like that. So. Again, yeah, I can't say without actually looking at the, the the player things themselves, but that is fascinating in and of itself. Um, but yeah, I think games like Civ really struggle with the fact that they're the very core of the game itself is a statement. Yeah, and I think the two the, the, again, I can't answer the question, but I can just sort of talk about things that sort of the question and what Holly's talk talked about and sort of make me make me think of like one was that um, back at, when I was working at the VNA, we used to um, host a conference and one of the panels that we had was challenging this idea of sort of historical authenticity. And we like with the talks, we used to try and bring together speakers who had sort of um, not conflicting, but sort of complementary or contrasting um, perspectives. And so we had somebody from um, the Total War series coming and talking about the way that they research history and the way that they make sure sort of that history is sort of represented in the games. And the other speaker that we had sort of paired up with that was um, Megna Giant from um, who who created the game 80 Days. 
and talking about 80 days, which if you've played that game, it's one which um, subverts the notion of that period of history that that sort of um, that, that story is set within and sort of seeks to um, create the sort of or creates a subversion of um, sort of which which sort of um, parts of the world sort of have sort of authority or have sort of power within that period. And so for us, it was sort of kind of coming at that, trying to challenge that idea about, okay, well, is it a singular notion of authenticity? And also just creating a game where the narrative is intentionally subverting everything that we know um, about that period. But in doing so, does that actually force us to confront our expectations and actually lead us towards um, sort of a more authentic sort of approach to it in the fact that it forces us to question and challenge our assumptions? Um, but the other project that I was thinking of as well was um, specifically when we're thinking about simulation games and specifically Sim City games, um, and Holly's point about the way that since the way that the game systems, regardless of sort of the narrative and that that the, the, the systems implicitly sort of place a um, a value that that is very telling about sort of our real world assumptions about the designer, but also about the player. And there's one example that I really love from. Um, from the games designer and artist Paolo Puduccini is Muller Industrium. When he talks about SimCity, he talks about the way that um, players um, in areas can get frustrated when they have an area of high crime, um, but they uh, to, to counter putting crime, to counter that crime of uh, uh, that area of high crime, they put a police station in didn't work let's put more police stations in it's not worked and and it's this idea that we have that, that the game is telling us the way that you counter sort of that the, the, the problem is crime the way that we solve it is putting a police station in which is an incredibly political statement within itself and um and the the the, the other thing that's sort of the, the last thing i mentioned about sims games in that which also then leads me on to the work of matteo ditani who um is another sort of italian um artist and person who looked at sims games and he created a really fascinating book which is um, about homelessness in the SimCity games, and he took the um, the questions that and the issues that were listed in um, an online forum of people complaining about bugs in the game, about the fact that they couldn't solve homelessness in parts of the city, um, because again, like the police station example, they're trying to like, we've tried busing them out, we've tried doing this, and I can't clear them out, and it's such a scourge, and I'm having real problems with the homelessness, and when you divorce those comments from the context of a game, you realise, and it, it it, can, it shines such a strong light on that political emphasis. And you realize that kind of as the question was alluding to, that the players aren't necessarily seeing beyond the mechanics of the game um, and, and, and seeing that political intention until something something like the work of Mateo sort of shines that light or shows that work and shows the way that people are interpreting it back to them. So, yeah, those were the two the two sort of the, um, examples that I wanted to bring up about Sims games and um, and history. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. And I think like the, the stuff that you sort of talk about there is like the rhetoric of a game, like the persuasiveness of those arguments, right, that, that come out in SimCity, you know, please say, you know, those instances don't change it. You actually need to be thinking about it in a different way because that's the rhetoric of like the designers and, and the game itself. And these systems, like procedural rhetoric being one of the Ian Bogos sort of foundational ideas about how games like uh, project certain viewpoints and that, that type of thing. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Um, and to, uh, to sort of tying it back to the sort of notion on Civ, I was sort of just, again, furiously scribbling it. Um, uh, the notion, so reading uh, Sid Myers's autobiography was quite instructive when I was doing some research on Civ to sort of understand the perspective of the sort of, again, come back to the, a, a term I've used today, like manifestos again of history. Uh, in some ways, like, the Civ series, and I think for his own words as well, like was this is this quite um light historical view? Like it's history that's intended, you know, it's projected for like school kids, and that's where it came from, right? So to learn about it in in those framings. Um and so a, a quote that I've sort of taken is like, in some ways, it's a bit of a quote, greatest hits of history, right? So, you know, we as, as a view of history where, you know, civilization discovers fire and then it discovers the wheel and that type of thing. And then we have um, these nations that then come in on top of that. So the work that I do is around looking at how sort of Japan is represented. Um, and a lot of the depictions that we see of Japan in Civ focus on like the Sengoku period uh, where warring civil war basically however sort of very modern contemporary views of japan are sort of not really shown and that history isn't really shown except in some very uh small examples in the most recent civ 
I hope it's still Civ 6. If there's been a Civ 7, I've been severely resting on my laurels. But um, there's a building called the Electronics Factory. And although systemic, uh, uh, in a sort of system sense, there aren't many extra bonuses afforded to it. There are some. Um, you know, that unit produces culture as well as producing sort of electricity and that type of thing. And there's a rhetoric there that speaks to sort of the power of uh, Japanese electronics in the 20th century and, and the development in the post-war period, and also the sort of cultural impact of and uh, the, the, the way I sort of frame it, um, anime games and these types of things, how how potent they are as a cultural force. Um, and the thing with something like Civ is obviously it's as a genre, it's about, I mean, do they call it 4X now? But, you know, exploit and exterminate and all these quite you know horrible terms but it's all about conquest and that type of thing so that's there's that framing already but there's also these curations of history that are designed in within these systems and these limitations of the historical framing so i think players are often yeah coming up against that in sort of quite a like a tense way so i think that might be why alex is sort of seeing these um out, outcomes from this sort of creative writing um but it, I th yeah so i think it's i don't think i hope i've answered that question in some way but i think there is a, a tension there that you, you know i think could be really interesting to carry on exploring thank you all and and you you're reminding me that uh, so a phd student i've been working with who, who defended his thesis successfully uh, last week um a guy called lee mcsee uh writing about um civilized in part about civilization's representation of china and the way that civilization games always set China into the past um, and never allow it to, to appear to be a contemporary society, uh, which is just really interesting about, again, the rhetoric of those games and the way that they, they, they present the world. So we've got a question from Will Butler, who has sadly had to leave, but we shall answer the question anyway, because it's a it's a, a thoughtful question that we can talk about. Um, do you think that the concept of a fixed game canon, for example, lists that offer the top 100 most important games of all time, is damaging towards a preservation effort. I'll just absolutely. <laughs> uh, the canons are there to be to be challenged. Uh, uh, I sort of my uh, some of my day to day work. I work with uh, design students. We talk a lot about sort of design canons uh, and uh, all all the work that we do around sort of uh, decolonizing the curriculum. I think centers around that notion of of challenging the canon as well like uh it's a you know there you can you can um i say respect the canon you can acknowledge the canon exists but also acknowledge that there are you know hundreds of thousands of other examples that you are excluding by not the, by not looking away from the canon so you know um indie games uh, the some of the the some of the amazing work that uh when I was at the, the uh, National Video Game Museum while I was working there was because of the sort of work that we were able to do with um, developers from, uh, small developers from Sheffield or small developers just across the world. Um, and that's why events like Bit Summit that still take place like yearly, you know, where independent developers come together are so important. Um, I, yeah, I just think uh, those those types of structures this is very anti-establishment of me, but those structures are there to be, are there to be challenged, are there to be uh, uh, toppled in some way so yeah absolutely um destroy the canon and let's let's uh let's find some interesting new examples to talk about <laughs> doesn't there's almost an inevitability i think it's like a question of like are they damaging but it's just sort of like i feel sort of powerless to sort of that th th there's a system in a machine that just loves to do that and it's going to do that and it's going to keep saying the same things over and over again or it's going to be the same sort of five or six games that will shuffle around the top but it was one of the things with especially with the video games exhibition at the vna that when we approached that it was really we we set out and we did i did say in a lot of in a lot of interviews like we are not establishing a canon here this is not a canon of games that we have selected these for specific reasons but we still you still face a lot of pushback because if you're an institution like the vna and you are putting on an exhibition and there are specific games that are not present, you're seen as not having fulfilled a certain duty. And like one of those specifically was Grand Theft Auto. Um, and first, the thesis of the exhibition was that it was about games that were radically doing something different in regard in in response to technological changes um, and um, 
and uh, so a catalyst that had happened from the mid-2000s. And so for us, we, we had selected games that we could see a clear example of where they were doing something different or where they were pushing, challenging on oceans of what video games are. Um, and so there was a reason why a lot of games weren't necessarily represented in there that people would have assumed. Um, and that there was a lot of games as well that it often took, like, it was often challenging for me even as a curator to be told by the institution that, hey, when I'm selecting games that are not things that most people would be familiar about, like, um, bringing in sort of um, some of the independent games and independent titles that we did and some of some of which I hadn't actually been released it was just like it's okay because you are able to select these games because you can justify why they have a significance and they do have a significance and they are important so I don't know whether we can stop those sort of lists or that sort of canon sort of happening because it's just what people enjoy and it's obviously sort of um, people love arguing about those things as well but it's also understanding like the places in which you can be empowered to challenge that and you can sort of make those arguments for for re-establishing and sort of um, and pointing at significant works um that that sit outside of what we might consider um that sort of that, that that sort of traditional canon and also me just getting told off because why is why is like grand theft auto not in the exhibition it's like well it's just not like <laughs> i find especially having been a journalist you're like yeah you listicles lists people love them that you know i think the only ones i've agreed to contribute to in the last few years is when it's um it's very explicitly said this is your personal um you know you set your own guidelines of what you find and I'm just like sure um because again I agree with Michael and and Marie where it's like the yeah the although I kind of a part of me is like no let's not get rid of it because they're fascinating they tell us far more they don't tell us any well I'm not gonna say they don't tell us anything but they tell us very little about the actual games themselves they tell us so much about the time that they were created and by who they're created and what they're what is important and you know and what is all this and so um yeah and so they this idea of kind of like you know the top 100 or list or canon or whatever is so fascinating because by as with any kind of categories categorization or anything like that it tells you far more about the people doing the categorizing than it does about the things being categorized um you know we see it in terms of like early play studies and early you know early game studies and any well in anything really that is that kind of tries to you know put names on things and place things in certain things they tell you you know we might kind of take little bits of theory or take little bits of whatever and create a lovely collage to use in our own kind of research. But essentially those things at their very heart um, will always tell you about the people that created them more than the actual thing. And same with all our work, you know, all our work will, uh, we we cannot escape the, I think we should, we should always push back against the idea as, as Michael said, you know, I'm not going to swear, but yes, uh, <laughs> get rid of canon as an idea because it is inherently, you know, this idea is inherently, structured and it is kind of often incredibly biased in all manner of ways um but also we cannot escape the fact that we are all subjective beings and so if just if we if we insist on going down the route of ranking or listing or creating these kind of things that in and of itself is a statement and we cannot escape our subjectivity on that um you can't i i wonder if you you can you someone else will be able to speak to this with far more eloquence but can you create a decolonial canon or is it just the canon itself is a colonial aspect and of it's uh, doing that but um yeah i don't that's that's a question for someone far more intelligent than me who can answer to that but i think but i think it is interesting and 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 you have to be significantly intelligent to ask the question in the first place don't forget so bear that in mind i i, I think the, the the thing that's also interesting from what you're saying is the way in which you know if we think of games as an area which is still developing its cultural presence in a lot of ways what what some of these lists do as well is they they enable us to sort of interrogate who's making these decisions right Who, who's getting to set this this argument up and you know we sort of understand that quite well around things like film maybe but maybe less so around games so where is cultural power that's you know part of that argument about culture intermediation and and cultural capital and so on um so we have a we have a good last minute question in the chat from biggles bristol um which is a nice finisher actually i think so if you could use a magic wand to change anything about the way that games engage with history what would that be and why apart from smashing the canon and and law <laughs> And obviously we'll hold you to this. You have to get now go on a go on a long stem <laughs> I know. I'm just I'm trying campaign. to think of like, oh, what am I gonna regret saying? Um <laughs> uh yeah. I guess I guess for me, 
for me personally, and I think we are seeing less and less of this is, um, and which is great. Um, but the idea of, um, like there is nothing more boring to be asked as a historian to be asked about a game of going, what's accurate in this game? What's accurate? Is this accurate? And it's just like, oh man, that's the most boring thing you could do. First of all, by the very medium it is, it's never going to be accurate. What do you even mean by accurate? Accurate to which histories, blah, 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 all of that. But also it's just such a boring way of viewing history <laughs> and boring what can be done um, with history in terms of as creative output, as inspiration, as all of this. Um, so yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna use my magic wand to get rid of those discussions around accuracy just for my own sanity more than anything else. I mean, I mean, you do realise you've removed all of the Steam forums about historical games by doing that. Ah, uh, but I work in a, <coughs> I work pre-1960, so, uh, <laughs> so I'm out. You wish it on a monkey paw, Holly. <laughs> Curls its finger and you're like, wait, what have I done? And I don't know, I think, I think it's less, I can't, I can't remember the exact phrase of the question, but it doesn't matter because I've got an answer to something anyway, um, which is this, I think, I guess it's less about what happens um, but more, and especially, I say this coming from a museum background, because it sounds like the conversations here and sort of the conversations with people who are working in academia and in, um, in universities and institutions, like there is such rich ability to go in depth into these subjects, to look at these histories and to value them and to appreciate them. And there is a system that is doing that. For as somebody who has worked in large institutions, and I've been fortunate to work with those institutions, I I feel frustrated that I look at curatorial roles that come up for museums and I see things for very specific periods in history and you're doing this very specific role. But for contemporary culture, it's like, well, here's the digital curator and you're covering all of digital and you're here's the curator for this. And so for me, I guess the wish is not necessarily that anything would change because I think there's such rich work happening, but it is just not valued and it is not perceived and it is not resourced um, within museums in the way that sort of more established history historical sort of subjects are. So I guess for me, that is just the, the magic sort of wand wish is, is instead not necessarily changing anything, but just changing the institutional ability to um, prioritize and resource that work, which I don't know where that's coming for, from, but, um, and I don't know what it, like unintended things my monkey poor wish is going to cause to happen, but so be it. Thank uh, you, Michael. Oh, uh, plus one for Holly's, Holly's comment. That's that's that that would be my very short answer, and I, I think I think Esther's also saying that in the comments as well. It, it distilling those conversations down to that that question always seems to be like, well, we're just going to go in the same circle. We're just going to be repeating the same things, um, and they're not uh, they're not as interesting as all this all these other like um, wrinkles about history and games. Like something that I'm really interested in is sort of music history and sort of games in that sense how the legacy of games so particularly I'll, I'll be really quick about this um the how like sound fonts and samples from systems like uh the snes or the sega mega drive have been repurposed as sort of and transposed into like pop music so um something like <laughs> This is really uncool of me to say, but I will if I'm ever like doing writing and want to list something like that. There's a Ste uh, Steely Dan Age album, but done through Super Mario 64 font, and you just listen to that with the with the plinky plonks of all these samples from uh, <laughs> from Super Mario 64, and that for me is very meditative, and very very interesting. But again, interesting how the legacy of the game. I don't think again when Super Mario 64 was um, made and released that it would ever have any correlation to the uh, historical music of Steely Dan, um, but now it does. It lives on 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 YouTube in in this sort of um, in this world. My real answer. Alongside plus plus things one to Holly is that having the industry, I would love the industry to sort of uh, value its own history as well. The, a lot of the work that I do with preservation, valuing like sort of the design materials, valuing um, uh, debugging tools, valuing all these different parts of it, um, uh, prototypes, these things that are all now so sadly like lost to history and lost to time. Uh, these, if we could get all those materials back. That would be that would be super, and I'm you know when I'm starting to see uh, good trends about valuing like these materials. I just wish that it had happened earlier. I guess. Do I have time to quickly add you to do. that? Because oh yeah, I feel that 
yeah so much and that and it's related to Maria as well where it's like um because I'm in the awkward position where I look at history in play but I also look at history of play and people it's they kind of confusing and actually a lot of kind of play and games it's really in this real digital bubble and why I re really appreciate things like historical games network where it it isn't just digital because often I've, it seems to be happening more and more but I would so often be invited to things and I would be like the lone analog person in a digital conference and it's just like okay but actually you know maybe that's not a really helpful axis to look at but yeah um and I was talking to a friend recently like especially what you were talking about Michael was like one of the reasons I I picked the time period of research that I look at for many reasons, because I really like old things. Um, but also because for the very, it's very depressing to say, but in many ways it is easier to research games that were made a hundred years ago <laughs> than games, games that are far more contemporary because they're, they're anything digital, anything kind of internet based is so ephemeral. And, you know, unless, you know, touch wood, fingers crossed, there's a fire at the archive, you know, my stuff is, safe <laughs> in terms of I can go and play it it's relatively accessible to people it's um yeah and so yeah the fact that it is in many ways easier to research Victorian board games than it is contemporary you know live service or internet games is very and you find wild. like a forum I like me again digging around like the early days of Minecraft to looking at YouTube and you dig around forums that you find like you go into the internet archive and you're like and they're like, here's a picture from the first ever blah, blah, blah. And there is just a little white frog going, oh, oh. Yeah. And you just gone. realize it's all crumbling. And it's strange to be in an institution where I think I think the conversations have moved on and people do understand it, but from a the complexity of digital from a preservation perspective, which is mind boggling. But um, often sort of people looking at, well, if we can digitize this archive, then we'll have it forever. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Can we go? No, 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 way? no. Can we just print it all out onto paper? Because we know now in a hundred years, we know what's going to happen to that paper in a hundred mm. years. This PDF, this file, I don't, we, we don't know. Like, yeah. Was it like the government um, talking about digitizing or was it wills or something like that? And just every, you know, every single historian was just like, <laughs> do not, no, do not do that. Ball, just burn them all instead. <laughs> yeah. And alongside that, you've got like companies checking their business archives in a skip, right? Which is also yes, really yeah, helpful yeah. with all of the mergers. You know, they kind of the business archive disappearing all the time, and they've always been critical to board games research. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop. I'm really sorry. This has been an amazing discussion. Thank you all so much for for all of your thoughts and comments. Thank you to everybody in the audience for your questions and your um, engagement with the talks. Um, we will do another one of these uh, in a few months about something else. Um, uh, our next theme for Historical Games Network is technology. Um, and so we'll have a, a panel discussion about that. But for now, just thank you again to, to Michael, to Marie, to Holly. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely evening. And thank you all to our audience.